what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is why I think art is a vital psychological um, human need, particularly romantic art. Um, romantic art as Ayn Rand identified it. She held that romantic art recognizes free will as a fundamental aspect of man and shows and integrates our choices and values. This can result in a sense of optimism because it helps one stay focused on what can be changed for the better. I'm going to share with you an example of the power of art and philosophy through the ideas and experiences that led me to realize I am a romantic and why I now think everyone needs a little romanticism in their life. So to best show how far, to best show how far I have come, I need to show where I started. Uh, my story starts in May of 1981 when I was born in Green Bay, Wisconsin. My parents lived on a dairy farm and were looking forward to their first child. However, my arrival was not normal. It was immediately evident that something was wrong. I was x-rayed and had 13 broken bones, mostly from the process of being born. I even had earlier fractures in the womb that they found um, that had already healed before birth. So 24 hours after I was born, I was diagnosed with osteogenesis imperfecta, um, or for short, OI, or brittle bones. OI is a group of genetic disorders that prevents the proper formation of the connective tissue collagen throughout the body. Uh, there's lots of things that can go wrong because of that, but the primary manifestation of the disorder are fragile bones and short stature. But it can also include weak joints, fragile teeth, hearing loss, and even lung, heart, and neurological problems. Here you can see my silver-capped baby teeth, which had to be done because they would frequently chip and break off. So my parents had to deal with the risk of breaking my legs when they changed my diaper, or breaking my ribs and arms when they picked me up. So consequently, my early childhood was filled with fractures, casts, and hospitals. My right forearm had eight to 10 fractures alone by the time I was 10, and the forearm bones fused together. But the first time I remember breaking my right arm was when I fell out of my wheelchair in the parking lot before going to see Santa Claus. However, it was with my grandmother, and I insisted on seeing Santa before he went to the hospital anyway. Broken arm or not. But femur bones were the worst to break. They were the most painful and took the longest to fully heal. Uh, I've had several surgeries in an attempt to straighten my femurs so as to reduce fracture. Most fractures of the femur required a spica cast, which went from chest to toes and was kept on for an average of three months. These casts kept me immobile and were uncomfortable, hot, and itchy. The occurrence of fractures was very unpredictable. One day I could fall off of a chair and not break anything, and the next day I could break my arm by drying my head with a towel. My life could be stopped and my physical freedom taken from me at any random time. It was a looming uncertainty that developed into a lot of anxiety at a very early age. But this is not to suggest that it was always fractures and casts. While I may have been born with uh, unfortunate genetics, I was also born with an amazing family who helped me bring as much joy to my life as possible. Living on a dairy farm until I was about 10 made for a challenge to find things for me to do sometimes, as most of the activities of farm life were pretty physical. But I insisted on keeping up with my peers, fractures or not. Everything from making straw bale tunnels to racing my brother on the four-wheeler with my wheelchair. Unavoidably, though, there were times when my condition kept me from physical activity and I turned to art often. I loved to create and considered myself an artist before I could even say the word, proudly telling everyone I was an arsonist as I peddled my drawings <laughs> to family at holidays. This is one of my grandmother's favorites, being the comedian that she was, for if you can read my writing, you will see I could draw a horse way before I could spell one. The form of creation didn't matter. Drawings, blocks, Legos, painting, anything creative, I loved to do it. I could do some form of creativity even when I had a fracture. It gave me both physical and mental stimulation when I needed it most. I started aiming out very high with my artistic endeavors. I wanted to build Lego cathedrals and mansions out of Lincoln Logs. My dad likes to tell the story of how I would get so frustrated with him because he couldn't help me build a three-story, five-bedroom mansion out of Lincoln Logs. In middle school, I began experimenting with oil paint, mostly due to my religious commitment to watching Bob Ross on TV. <laughs> I became well-versed in the Rossian technique by the time I started high school. So when I did start high school, I was focused on drawing and painting. 
but also really looking to try as many different media as I could. My middle school and high school teachers, Mrs. Voigt and Mr. Dixon, were excellent. They let me spread my creative wings in all media and helped me to develop some of my artistic foundations. These are some high school pieces I did, um, and I tried everything from metalwork to ceramics to stained glass. I even began doing stained glass at home on my own, and by the end of high school, I was even doing commissions for teachers and family friends. Amidst all the experimenting with different media, I continued to draw and paint, though, and I often didn't have much concern or even understanding for the subjects that I chose. I was very into castles and medieval-type uh, drawings and things, but I was mostly focused on how to master the techniques. And I also didn't understand myself psychologically and what drew me to certain subjects. My fracture rate was declining at this point in my life due to increased bone mass and muscle mass, as well as a better understanding of the risks I can personally take. However, even with the lower frequency of fractures, I was dealing with the psychological aftermath of having this condition in the form of anxiety and depression. Art was one of the few places, though, I never felt anxious, depressed, or bored. Except when we were assigned self-portraits. I hated doing them. I could not help but reveal my anxiety and depression to these self-portraits, which made me uncomfortable because I tried to hide it from those around me as best I could. But I made it through high school and started college at the University of Wisconsin-Oshkosh in 1999. Obviously, you can tell from my senior picture that I liked art just a little bit. So I was going for my bachelor in fine art. Studying drawing was my early focus, of course, but I couldn't give up my love of glass. So I sought to expand what I learned through creating all the stained glass in high school. Actually, at the end of high school, I took a workshop on glass bead making. I learned to use a small table torch to melt glass rods into glass beads. Because the torch is used, this form of glass sculpting is called lamp working. I was in love with the process and wanted to delve deeper into it. So when I started college, my amazing sculpture professor, T.C. Farley, set me up with a small glass station down in the sculpture lab so I could study lamp working independently, as there were no glass programs or classes available at the time. Soon I upgraded my uh, glass projects and started making more complex things with lamp working. I started a series of glass sculptures exploiting the obvious analogy my condition has to glass. With these pieces, I wanted to focus on the symbolism of overcoming. Even with bones of glass, I can accomplish what I want in life. This sculpture was my final project for sculpture class. It is a full skeleton that is half my size, sitting on a ceramic rock. Essentially, a self-portrait that symbolizes my precarious life. Then I met Lee Hu, one of the drawing and painting professors at UWO. I was blown away by his skill and his passion. Additionally, Lee had a triumphant story to accompany his amazing artistic skill. He was an adolescent during the Cultural Revolution in China, in which Lee and his family would personally suffer. Lee's father was sent to a labor camp, and Lee was sent to work in the rice fields, and did not even get to attend high school. However, Lee overcame and got into Shanghai University Fine Arts College in 1984, learning the ways of traditional masters, and ended up teaching there by 88, and then coming to America a few years after that. Lee's work was monumental, and he was prolific. This is his largest work, The Birds of Nouveau. It is 16 feet tall by 42 feet wide. There were times when he could only show it on the ceiling of certain galleries. So I began to intensively study the figure and portraits under Lee, studying primarily by drawing the live model. I took every class I could from him. This is one of my earliest charcoal portraits I did at one of Lee's classes of a very good friend. Lee taught me the foundational skills to recreate any subject I chose, whether in pastel, watercolor, or oil painting. One of his favorite assignments was to, to improve our drawing skills was to assign self-portraits, much to my dismay. We would be assigned to create one or two dozen self-portraits some semesters. Self-portraits are one of the most convenient ways to learn portraiture. After all, you always have a model right there in front of you. But there was more to Lee assigning self-portraits than just to improve our skill. This was a watercolor um, 
one of the very first assignments he gave to us, a self-portrait, that he wanted to be more than just a straight-up portrait from a mirror. Um, a a self-portrait that showed something about yourself beyond just your physical likeness. So I reflected on how far I had come and what I had dealt with, from fractures to surgeries to my mental health. This piece ended up being a major professional boost for me as well, as it won the top award of $10,000 in a national show for artists with disabilities. But more importantly, this painting started me on a path of introspection. I reluctantly began working with more self-portraiture, driven by a higher confidence from winning that award, the direction of Lee Hu, and the goal of understanding myself psychologically. My work was becoming my diary, each painting being a page of a single book. So I started using my work to come to terms with some of my experiences and my identity. Dealing with OI will always be a part of my life, and I need to put in the effort to make it as efficient to deal with as possible. While the fact of me having OI is out of my control, I can control how I deal with it. Being this, being this psychologically honest with myself through my work, well, and honest with everyone else, was a challenge for me to get over. But the assignments from Lee helped to push me forward. This was another assignment from Lee in which he asked us that we paint a double self-portrait. Um, but more specifically, a double self-portrait where one version of yourself is showing how you see yourself and the other version showing how you think others see you. In this assignment, Lee got us to ask an important question of ourselves. And in answering this question, I was more psycho psychologically honest with myself than I had been before. Others would often tell me how happy and brave and strong I seemed, but this was not how I felt. I saw myself as weak and fearful and would often hide behind this persona that others created for me. So at this point in college, I had a major surgery coming up the following semester to remove a plate from one of my femurs and replace it with a rod, which is a metal uh, rod that goes down the middle of the bone instead. It was a major surgery and I would, be, I would have to skip the following semester. I was dreading it and additionally I was overwhelmed by my new freedom and responsibility in being on my own. I was overwhelmed with college overwhelmed with loneliness. I was overwhelmed by life and didn't have the confidence or self-esteem to combat the sense of futility that I felt. And I also had struggled through depression and suicidal thoughts periodically throughout high school. So on a very snowy Wisconsin day in college, I had an unusually hard time getting to and from class through the snow. And it had pushed me over a tipping point. My mind broke and I tried to take my own life. Trying to end my life is something I had to come to terms with and find a way to heal. And creating self-portraits was one of the ways I would heal. This painting is painful, but it is something I should never forget. It is important in that it represents a rebirth. A rebirth in the sense that my suicide attempt had shown me that there is something hard I must face. I have always felt a dualism within myself. I could swing dramatically from being very optimistic down to a deep cynicism, even nihilism. Creating art was one area of my life where I didn't have this feeling, though. I knew that being an artist was more than just a profession for me, but I couldn't really explain it. So it was somewhat serendipitous that around this period I read The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, at the suggestion of a good friend. The Fountainhead impacted me and sparked something in me like nothing had before. It moved me intellectually, aesthetically, and spiritually. I wanted to create art that motivated me like The Fountainhead did. There were so many important things in The Fountainhead that really made me think deeply. So many things I got from it. But primarily though was that Ayn Rand showed me through her character, Howard Rourke, what I needed to gain. I needed to gain a self. When Rourke asked the question, and isn't that the root of every despicable action, not selfishness? But, pre but precisely the absence of a self? This question was key to something that started me down a whole new road. So I graduated from UW Oshkosh in 2005 with my Bachelor of Fine Art. 
emphasizing in drawing, painting, and sculpture. While my senior show was still hanging as a requirement for graduating with a fine arts degree, you have to have a show at the end. Um, while it was still hanging, the gallery curator of a local college came and saw it and asked if I would create a larger collection of self-portraits for their gallery. Um, this was another push I needed to introspect deeper. This was my first solo show, and I had a year to create enough work to fill the gallery. Delving further into self-portraiture, along with devouring everything I could by Ayn Rand, my perspective began to shift. This new self-portrait series, again, would start with my past. I realized I cannot ignore my past struggle, as it is important to understanding myself, and stresses the value in overcoming it. I started with this series of 12 small paintings that hang like a film strip, each painting symbolizing a week in a spica cast, as 12 weeks in a cast was the average to heal a femur bone. Due to time, I'm not going to show each individual painting of the 12, but the series included the roller coaster of emotion that accompanies a major fracture. From pain and fogginess to unavoidable boredom, and even the small joys and pleasures that helped me forget about the state I was in. Always ending in the longing to be free. And finally, the inevitable, indescribable feeling of finally being free from the cast. These experiences are important to me as a simple reminder of how much I love my freedom and the fact that I can get through it. But it is also a reminder to take full advantage of every, of every moment that I am free from fracture. This is the pity party. The view that life is only struggle. Life is only about escaping pain and that it is futile to try for anything beyond that. It is hopelessness, apathy, and nihilism. It is playing the victim and leads to more depression and anxiety. A self-fulfilling cycle and the most futile of all. This is the view I needed to purge. Ayn Rand's work caused me to question the idea of pity and its relation to myself. I could now admit how much I disliked being pitied, yet sat in a space of self-pity far too often, wasting my time that I was free from fracture. Having been completely helpless at many times in my life and having little to no self-esteem, I implicitly thought that pity was the only currency I could rely on. Self-pity is also the search for an excuse, an excuse to give up and not even try. Dwelling on the negative, Staying in a state of resignation both earned me pity from others as well as fooled myself into feeling justified for not even trying. But this painting is about my shift away from the pity party to looking ahead rather than only backward. Using art and philosophy, I was starting to understand myself, resulting in a shift of my psychological view to heal my soul so I can get out of my head and enjoy life. To stay focused on the positive thoughts, for I have free will, and I'm not doomed to dwell on the negative. If I could fill my mind with good thoughts, there would be no room or time to think about the bad ones. Life is not about avoiding death, but rather life is about seeking happiness. To contemplate pain and suffering over what it takes to overcome it becomes only dwelling. A quote from the Romantic Manifesto really struck me in this regard. Ayn Rand writes, consider the significance of the fact that the naturalists call romantic art an escape. Ask yourself what sort of metaphysics, what view of life that designation confesses. An escape from what? If the projection of value goals, the projection of an improvement on the given, the known, the immediately available is an escape, then medicine is an escape from disease. Agriculture is an escape from hunger. Knowledge is an escape from ignorance. Ambition is an escape from sloth. And life is an escape from death. 
If so, then a hardcore realist is a vermin-eaten brute who sits motionless in a mud puddle, contemplates a pigsty, and whines that such is life. If that is realism, then I am an escapist. So was Aristotle, so was Christopher Columbus. My life would never be what I wanted if I just settled for the given. I was fine being labeled an escapist as well, because I was escaping that which should be escaped from, pain, depression, anxiety. So I was creating a new relationship with myself to eliminate the dualism I felt within so I could push myself to greater goals. My self-confidence was growing, and as proof, I took a trip to the Grand Canyon with some friends after I graduated from college, which is the first time I had gone on a trip without family or my usual safety net. It was something I had to do in spite of my anxiety about it. But the surgery I was dreading in college to rod my second femur actually was very successful. And because of that, I'm able to walk now without aid short distances. Thanks. Um, and yes, I actually did walk, climb around on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I now see the type of view I needed to have about myself and of existence. If I come to terms with my past, accept my identity, and realize my values, I can finally look to the horizon and set realistic goals. This painting symbolizes the opposite of pity party. My life should be celebrated, not pitied. It is a reminder to always work to create a better self-image and that it is a never-ending process that giving life meaning and setting goals and standards isn't really possible without a positive self-image. Valuing oneself is the first and primary value, that anything I gained out of self-reliance was tenfold more fulfilling than what I could gain from the pity of others. I am no good to my values and loved ones anyway when I am in a place of self-disdain. It is near impossible to accept the love or give it to others when you don't love yourself. I was habitually skeptical of the sincerity of others, feeling that the praise and friendship was ultimately out of pity, until I could objectively agree with them. By my own standards and judgment, did I even begin to accept some truth in what others would say. I wanted to see myself more clearly, objectively. Only then could I see the world more clearly and work better within it. And an inaccurate view of myself inevitably leads to an inaccurate setting of my own standards. Just as you need to set standards for measuring the world out there, you also must set your standards for measuring your values in here. The Romantic Manifesto presents the idea that art is fundamentally the objectification of value, which is an essential psychological need to a conceptual being and that romantic art is particularly important because it focuses on free will and how things ought to be to sharpen how you evaluate your choices and values. This focus can prompt a deep introspection, which is vital for a healthy psychology by getting you to continue to ask questions of yourself. My feelings were finally starting to catch up with my new perspective. I was the most confident I had ever been and I started doing talks like this, which I, would have had, which I would have thought unthinkable in high school or even a few years before. And I started driving my work all over the country to different shows and conferences, both of which gave me anxiety, but I pushed myself to do it anyway. Compared to how I saw myself in my high school portrait, it is clear to see how my perspective of myself has changed. All the things I implicitly included symbolize so much beyond what I understood when I created this piece. The cracked mirror, the looking away from myself, the colorless reflection. But now I felt a sense of harmony with myself as I continued to introspect and see that I was ultimately responsible for the way that I am. That much of my anxiety in life came from my reliance on others and was lifting the more I learned to rely on myself. This is not to suggest that I don't get a lot of help from my awesome family and friends sometimes still, but I'm speaking in a psychological, even spiritual sense. Ayn Rand once said we are beings of self-made soul, 
for which I now understand better. You are the only one with direct access to your soul. You are the only one who can truly feel it. It is a universe within the universe that only you can sense. You can show aspects of, the, of your universe to others, but they can never perceive it directly the way that you can. The choices you make in the development of your character can only be done by you. Others can certainly help through guidance and example, but ultimately the work is yours. In that sense, psychologically speaking, we are all islands and therefore self-made. I could now clearly see the power of philosophy. This is how other philosophies made me feel. Each brick is an idea piled on, trying to reach for something. But it is a, dis it is a disintegrated mess, doomed to topple, stifling your life's potential rather than improving it. I needed to see concretized the attitude I should have about life. This is how life should feel, a deliberately integrated foundation of knowledge that truly allows one to achieve soaring heights. These two paintings are meant to hang together in contrast as a reminder that, the philosoph that philosophy should be not confusing and disconnected from reality, but rather a tool to further one's own life and purpose. I now fully accept that life is knowable, happiness is possible, and that it is mine to live. Each premise building to the next all coming to a conclusion that I am a romantic artist. My love of creating stained glass never diminished, and I continued to create it between paintings. This is my dining room window, my most extensive glass project that I created completely for myself. It has about 2,293 pieces of glass, and it took several months to create, slightly smaller than three by four feet. It, it is the tree of knowledge, specifically the knowledge that it is all about continual growth in small steps, piece by piece. That now, the knowledge that I am better than I was yesterday, that tomorrow can be even better than today, and that this knowledge helps me enjoy the now. While I created this piece for myself, I was at this time building a small art business for a few years doing mostly commission work and selling in galleries, some of which was glass work. But commissions filled most of my professional time. I also did a few residencies in schools in which I did a little teaching as well as painting murals with the students. But commissions filled most of my professional time, doing them in drawing, painting, and glass, everything from mosaics to pets. And dozens and dozens of portrait commissions, which became my biggest request. But having done so many portraits, I needed to take a break from them at one point a few years ago. So I shifted my interest to still life, partly as a break from commission work and partly out of curiosity. Curiosity to see how to make the simplest things more interesting. But now I have really come to enjoy creating them. Creating still lifes are like little meditative moments. I can spend days to weeks selecting the objects, the arrangements, and the lighting. My main goal is to make everyday life more dramatic, even exciting, to find ways to bring the most out of life and then show what I have found. We essentially design our life with the objects we surround ourselves with. We need to be reminded of our values as often as possible to keep us focused on them, because it is easy to get overwhelmed in everyday life by the constant bombardment of perceptions and thoughts. The important needs to be pointed out and emphasized sometimes out of the repetition of day-to-day -day life, even in the seemingly mundane moments, or especially. As an analogy, I often think back on what my mentor Lee Hu fundamentally did for me that made me a better artist. Ultimately, he showed me that I needed to pay closer attention to what I perceive. 
He merely revealed to me things that were right there in front of me, but I could not see them because I was overwhelmed by the magnitude of perceptual data. He would simply walk around class as we were all drawing the model and come up to each of us and simply show us what we were not seeing. He would only have to say simple things like, pay more attention to this area. Or, there's a reflection over here on that object that is missing. And from then on, I would see reflections on everything, even in the most non-reflective of surfaces. They were now glaringly evident, like when you learn a new word and it seems to pop up everywhere all of a sudden. Still life works this way too. It shows us what to look for to make every moment special. So that like hearing a newly learned word everywhere, you can spot these special moments in your day-to-day -day life and make life so much more interesting and worth living. But little makes life more interesting and worth living than the people we surround ourselves with. Unlike a still life, or even a landscape, the subjects are always one of a kind. The objects in a still life can be replaced. A beautiful scene can be revisited. But the people in your life and the moments you share with them are irreplaceable. Other people can be the source of our greatest joys, and combined with the fact that we are all inherently finite and irreplaceable, portraits can move us the most. Portrait painting is about more than just capturing a likeness. It is also about capturing emotion. Or a shared moment. Or the love between two people. Or the reverence one feels for someone. Lee had become more than just my professor. He is my mentor and my friend. And so it was shortly before he passed away, I was able to do this portrait of him. Lee's love of creation and passion for his work was profound. As an example of his attitude or sense of life, here is a direct quote from him out of a video another one of his students recorded. He told us, you know, I tell you the truth, okay? When I'm working here, when I am staying in my house, every day I want to go down. Even if I don't paint, I just look at my paintings. Just like the way you look at your baby. You know you enjoy it. That's your kids. Lee would often tell us that passion is more important than talent. What I think he meant was not that passion is a better guide than reason, but rather that, a that in a certain context, passion has a primacy over skill. Your passion for something must be more powerful than disappointment. In other words, my desire to create art was always stronger than the desire to avoid the stumbling and disappointments that are inevitably involved in learning how to create. My passion, or love of creation, is the source of my skill, in the sense that it's what drove me to improve my skill. My passion came first, and my skill followed. When my passions fade, my skills go unused. And I now realize this is applicable to my whole life, beyond just the creation of my work. Passion for my whole life should be stronger than the impulse to avoid the pain involved with life. Li Hu and Ayn Rand showed me their passion for their life through their work and they fueled my fire within like no one had before. That I was so fueled simply by seeing their example was proof to me of the power of seeing a vision, a vision of the best it could be, the essence of romanticism. Summed up best by a quote from the Fountainhead, don't work for my happiness, my brothers. Show me yours. Show me that it is possible. Show me your achievement and the knowledge will give me courage for mine. I want and implicitly always have wanted to show a reverent view of reality. But I have learned that holding a reverent view of life is not automatic. In any one moment, our mind can only focus on so many things at one time. And what you focus on, you will find. You will see it everywhere. 
Whatever you are used to looking at every day is what you will see the most of. If what you are focused on is always negative, then that is what your mind will look for and it will show you as a habit. If you can make it a habit to direct your focus on the good, the positive, then there will be no room in your lens for the negative. There will only, this will only reinforce your habit of focusing on the good. There will be so much light that there will be no room for dark. So in other words, whatever you set your gaze upon becomes magnified. What you shine your light onto becomes clearer. So it is vital to set your gazing light to a view which helps you flourish. A view that allows for a certain type of serenity that washes away all the mundane in everyday life, all the anxiety and all the struggle and allows one's passion to gain in strength. Ayn Rand's unique conception of romanticism, which she named romantic realism, particularly hit home with me and is primarily what I identify as now. The idea that art should be focused on showing life as it ought to be and could be. Perfectly concretized in a quote from the play Ideal, which touched me on a profoundly personal and artistic level. Ayn Rand writes, I want to see real, living, and in the hours of my own days, that glory I create as an illusion. I want it real. I want to know that there is someone somewhere who wants it too. Or else what is the use of seeing it and working and burning oneself for an impossible vision? A spirit too needs fuel. It can run dry. I am a romantic because I seek a better version of life an improvement on the given. But I am also a realist because I want this better version to be real and achievable. Romantic realism is inherently optimistic, but it is more than that. It is wider than just optimism. It is for showing that values are possible within this life, but also that they must be earned and freely chosen. Even psychological values must be earned, earned by focusing on the right attitude, Romantic realism helps me maintain focus on a particular attitude that I should have, essentially the attitude of the first part of the serenity prayer, which reads, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, and wisdom to know the difference. The realism represents the things I cannot change, and the romanticism represents the things that I can change and should change. I need the realism with the romantic because it is more than just positive thinking. Only thinking positive thoughts can, lean can lead one to overlook information that could be important to understanding how to accept what is in your control and what is not. But I also greatly need the romantic with the realism because it is more than just thinking about what is. Else, one might not be able to find the courage to change what can and should be changed. I think of it as a sort of psychological objectivity. Without this, it is very easy to be quite unfair in judging oneself. I realize I was far more just to my friends and family than I ever was to myself, and I see this habit in so many others. Romantic realism, in a sense, helps me stay psychologically objective, which in turn grants me serenity, courage, and wisdom. The realist and the romantic within myself could work together and that they were really two sides of the same coin, the coin that is my love of life. And this attitude is what keeps my passion burning, for I am all too aware that this burning can fade. This fire needs to be fed and protected. One of my favorite quotes is from Atlas Shrugged. Do not let your fire go out, sparked by irreplaceable spark in the hopeless swamps of the approximate, the not quite, the not yet, the not at all. Do not let the hero in your soul perish in lonely frustration for the life you deserved but have never been able to reach. Check your road and the nature of your battle. The world you desire can be won. It exists, it is real, it is possible, it's yours. But everyone's spark has a limit, a tipping point, it is only by matter of degree within the context of each individual's life 
The struggles of hard times, of loss and disappointment can wear away one's passion for living and the darkness of nihilism can begin to encroach. To combat this darkness, we need romantic art to keep us looking ahead at what is possible, to show the joy that life has to offer and that overcoming the struggle is worth it. These moments of joy of experiencing one's values here and now protect your inner fire from being blown out by the winds of struggle. I created this stained glass lantern to represent that needed protection. Each piece of glass is like a facet of my sense of life. All my experiences of joy, joy now in the moment, joy remembered from the past, and joy that is possible in the future. So art is like a light, which we use to illuminate and clarify, parsing out the important in life. And romantic realism is a particular way of using that light, a light that reveals our most fundamental values and choices. I now realize it is far more than just a theory of art. It is a whole attitude about life. Romantic realism keeps, me, keeps you focused on where you're going. It keeps your eye on the prize, so to speak. I now choose to focus my light on the reverent moments, the moments that make the struggle worth it and lead to a passion for that irreplaceable value which is your life. This fire, this passion, only you can sense and care for, and it needs to be tended at all times. It is up to you to discover what fuels your fire. Just as you consume the physical values to nourish your body, you must also consume the spiritual values that nourish your soul and keep your passion burning. Passion for your life is the source of curiosity, ambitiousness, benevolence, and ultimately success. Like an inoculation against nihilism, romanticism provides a defense of your passion. It is the vitamin of the soul for which you need a regular dose. I now see this as my purpose, to create that dose of romanticism we all need. For some may be able to survive without life's burning passion, but they certainly cannot live without it. Many will tell you that life is not important because it is random and we are just cells and chemicals and everything you do is meaningless. Others will tell you that life is important because an unknow unknowable higher power created it and everything you do should be for the glory of God. But Ayn Rand told us life is important because it is the source of all values and everything you do should be for the glory of that irreplaceable value that is your life. So I will leave you with the question. Do you look down and accept things as they are, waiting for the challenge that is life to be over? Or do you look ahead and seek something better, taking a step and accepting this great challenge to make your life the best it can be? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all agree with Sarah. <laughs> um, so I don't know how much time I have left for questions, but I could take a couple. Otherwise, I will, I'll hang out by my table, too, if anyone wants to talk to me um, about other stuff. So. Question about uh, your mentor Lee. Yeah. He's often depicted with red and blue stripes on his shirt. Is that having a meaning to you? Not specifically, other than the fact that he wore that color, those two colors, all the time. Even a couple other students mentioned that to me. Like he was always wearing red and blue. And that was obviously the shirt he chose to wear the day that I went over there to get some photos of him and stuff like that, so. When I was younger, I used to draw quite a lot, just pencil drawings. And so I really like to talk because I, at one point, really was into art and all of that, and then I uh, was convinced that it could not make me money, so I <laughs> gave it all up, and now I'm back into it again. Good. Um, but um, I watch 
an objectivist on the internet named Yaron Brook. I'm sure you know him. Yep, I watch him. Um, and he recently released a talk, I don't know where it was, but it was about art and what it is. And um, he had stated that two things were not in his opinion. And I'm here to ask you what you think of he, those he two things. He stated that what? Two things I'm going to mention oh. were not art. OK. One of those things were video games. And he even said that he even didn't say that there was art in video games. He said he wanted it to, call, it to be called something else, but don't call video games art. And he didn't even say that there's art in video games, even though there's stories. There's aspects of art. Yeah. yeah. And also digital painting. <laughs> what do you think of digital painting? Uh, it's so complicated and there are so many aspects to look at those types of things. Um, art for me is a way of perceiving reality directly. And so the more things you put between your perception and the final product, the further it removes it from being pure art, in my opinion. So I could see why he would say possibly video games aren't art. But I think he would also say that it's possible that they could be someday in the future. I think I've heard him say that, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, that's just such a complicated, it's the same type of thing when people ask me if photography is art. And I have to, it, it's, it's a, not just a clear cut answer. Because it, it's like, if I think about set design or something, I consider that to be very artistic. And a piece of a larger whole that is the art. And it's a creative skill and it takes a lot to do, but I don't know if I would call it the final product of art. It's, a, a piece of it. So I guess that's how I would look at it. And digital painting, I don't know, because I've never really tried it. I can't say particularly what about it isn't art. And I don't know where he's coming from it either, because there's digital painting where you, you literally choose the colors and you apply each thing independently, just like you would with a paintbrush, but possibly because you're not mixing those colors yourself. I don't know. I'd have to like pick his brain about that to know more because I do consider some uh, digital art to be art. I wanted to thank you again. I enjoyed it even more this year and you got me all choked up again even though I, I kind of knew everything where it was going but um, it, w it was wonderful. My thank particular you. question is about how do you deal with lack of inspiration at times? Because I know people who are very creative, there, there are times when you just, you can't seem to muster, yep. you know, getting to work or, or being creative. You just don't feel like doing anything. It happens. How, how, do you, how do you deal with that? What are your strategies for dealing when you just don't feel like it? Well, a lot of times what I find that means is that you're, you need to recharge your, your soul, your subconscious. You need to feed it. it You've, you've gone for too long by just making too much stuff, and now your, your uh, mind wants something new, something different, and the creation that you've been doing feels old and boring. But that's why I like to do the several different media, because if I'm not feeling inspired, I can still go into kind of a craftsmanship mode and just make glass jewelry. And I still get to uh, keep that creativity moving, but I don't necessarily have to be, you know, completely in the, in the inspired mood, you know, to make something profound and, um, cause you can't force it. That's, it's like trying to force yourself to go to sleep or, you know, stuff like that. You got to let it kind of happen. So it, it's, I don't have any particular advice. I just tend to like, not force myself when I'm in those moods and just do something else then. You know, go and, you know, go see, go look at other art or uh, do, do other things you like to do. And eventually it will come, I think. Thank you. 
So my mom stole my original question, actually. That was my question. So I just came up with a new one, and I okay. am kind of getting the sense for your answer already from the answer you just gave. But in poetry, and for poets, there's I've heard two kind of types of poets that are talked about of you're either a cat poet or a bull poet. Okay. You either like do something when you want to, and when you don't want to, you take a nap, but when you want to at 2 a.m., you run to it. Sure. Uh, or you make yourself sit down, and even if you can't force the inspiration, you're going to sit there until the inspiration comes. Which one do you think you are? <laughs> I'm probably a little bit of both, uh, because I have found that helps. If I just sit myself in front of the painting, and have everything ready to go, you know, brushes and everything, I will start to pick at it. It's just like what I do. But I also don't like to force myself. Usually when I lose my inspiration, it's because something else is going on in my life that's distracting my, my mind, not letting me get fully into it. And so I try not to work in those cases. But there are times in those um, situations where me forcing myself to make art uh, gets me out of the habit of thinking of whatever's bothering me too much. You know, kind of um, gets me to uh, focus on something else for a little while. So I kind of do both. Um, having a business, I have to sit down and do it sometimes. So I have to have that aspect of it. But then there are times when something strikes me and I just have to do it like the new Apple painting with the magnifying glass and stuff. I started that one uh, four weeks ago and I'm like I'm gonna have this done for the conference and it, it was kind of a month ago last minute for an oil painting that's last minute. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know, I go with the flow for the most part. Good answer, thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a composer, um, and oh. sorry, I write music, and I, I really appreciated your um, uh, what you what you had to say about about art. And um, I was wondering, just as a practitioner of art and being very deep in the process of creating visual art, I was wondering what your perspective was on music. Oh well, I mean, I love it. I well that, as as an art form. Like, as what? Well, as an as an art form, and and. You mean, do I think it's as important? Or I mean, I listen to music. Well, how do you conceptualize it in terms of romantic realism and? Oh, well, I guess art can, or music in particular, can put you into an emotional state almost instantly before you even know why. And so, um, music has a really unique way of making you feel the way you want life to feel if you listen to the right music. You know, I mean, it kind of works the visual, too, if you're looking at the right stuff. But um, I mean, I listen to music all the time when I'm working. Not, not all the time, but a majority of the time. And I have a specific playlist that I call my sense of life playlist. And it, it's, what, mm, it, it's what life is to me, the sound of life. And then that I channel into my painting, I guess. So I, I even use music, I guess, to create work sometimes. What's Not your, all the time. What's your favorite piece of music? Oh, I don't know. Ah, those kinds of questions are the worst. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I like real kind of dramatic stuff. The only thing I always come back to when someone asks me this question is I like stuff like Florence and the Machine. Um, it's really grand and dramatic and um, deep at the same time. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, now I'm worried that you won't want to answer my question. <laughs> I was going to, well, my question is, who's your favorite artist and why do you love that person's work? Well, it's hard for me to say one favorite artist. I kind of, I have artists from the past that I look to. Um, I was very influenced by Dali, Salvador Dali, and Caravaggio, and even like Michelangelo and the classics like that. Um, 
But contemporarily speaking, um, there's an artist named Jeremy Lipking. Um, he's probably my favorite contemporary artist right now. Um, there's a few of them, but I love his work. It's bold and vibrant and beautiful. Um, he's the modern sergeant, if you ask me. Uh, very, you can still see brush strokes there, but it's a beautiful realism and a very human-centered, positive, beautiful. I hope you enjoyed that, and I invite you to join us for Level Up 2023 in Phoenix, Arizona, June 21 through 24. Speakers include Barry Weiss, Timothy Sandifer, Eric Daniels, and many more voices of reason. For information and to register, visit levelupconferences.org or click the link below. See you in Phoenix.